small community lang kaya uh, kailangan hindi uh, hindi ka nakakaapak ng katabi mo at tunay ng katabi ko lang ang um, yeah, mabasahin ko reaction so kung sa kanya dito at ikala ko din mabuti na lang natuloy ako so uh, uh, I can just ask uh, clusters of questions first <laughs> Are there particular historical linguistic shifts in translation tactics from the early efforts of the natives of colony to the exemplary intellectual nationalist pursuits of the Ilustrados? How has Spanish evolved in relation to the evolution of various vernaculars in the colony? Might not the analysis of Rizal's novels about Palacas's uh, play, the Katipunan newspaper and the various commercial coming to varying translation contacts and shifts in language? its regimentation by the Spanish colonizers, and its alternative use by the native intellectuals in the various historical periods concerned. Second, how does um, Rafael's translation figure in the first great translation project of the Spanish colonizers, that is, the recodification of the Baibayin or the native alphabet writing and linguistic system to what we now recognize as Romanized uh, Spanish? How does Rafael's notion of foreign figure the massive linguistic social, political, cultural, and economic paradigm shifts from the pre-colonial to the Spanish colonial periods. From what historians have revealed to us, the Baibayan was still very much in place even up to the 1800s. What does this mean that the vernacular, the, the, the vernacular at least in writing, has remained untranslatable? What does this refusal to be translated mean for the foreign? If the Filipino word for translate is salin and originally used in the recodification of the Baibayan writing into Spanish, the acts of writing and rewriting, not just words and phrases coming into being, also come into play in translation. How does the original Baibayan defy Spanish translation? How does translation account for the divergent writing native, the divergent uh, native writing strategy that has remained in place or in use even in, in the 1800s? Third set, uh, third um, question. Um, what, on the one hand, can the foreign always uh, be? Can the foreign be just? Uh, let me repeat that. Can the foreign be always just uh, be out there, refusing to be domesticated, but still sustaining the viability of future social project? How does it lose its uh, social and linguistic efficacy to steer nationalism and to simply be co-opted for colonial? and neo-colonial formations. At what point can the foreign be discarded, not vital to linguistic and nationalist discourse? On the other hand, is the foreign truly untranslatable? In what, in what the Illustrators have undertaken uh, in their Castilian translation for nationalism, is the translation the only optimizable linguistic discourse that can carry out the nationalist project? Fourth. Is the Castilian language the meta-language to localize the nationalist discourse? It seems that the analysis of major language formations through literature has to contend with the Castilian language. What is then the political efficacy of choosing to be regimented with the language of the colonial power? Is there no way out of nationalism, or is there no way out for the nationalists except to choose to engage primarily with Spanish? If not, what are the gradations of subjection in which contending nationalist projects can emanate from various vernacular languages and the Illustrados writing in Spanish. Fifth, to speak of the Illustrados is to speak of a small yet critical segment of Filipino intellectuals of the pre-Philippine Revolution period. How might a further class analysis of the contending and dialoguing forces that lead up to the ultimate nationalist project, the Philippine Revolution of 1896, inform us of a more nuanced rereading of the history and nationalism of the period. Outside the divergent translation tactics used, how does class reconceptualize the period's various nationalist projects? Six, for Filipinos of the present time, the bilingual education has created a nation, a nation of everyday translation and a classroom a site of everyday translation. We are asked a question in English by our teachers and we are told our mind goes through a, a delicate process of translation. First, how does a question translate in the vernacular first language? Second, what would be our response? Third, how do we translate our response to English? How does this everyday translation of the foreign exhibit the characteristics of linguistic nationalism Raphael defines in his study? 
Seventh, if the translation was indeed vital to the nationalist cause, how then does the coming into the fore of another foreign language or another foreign, an American English, recodify the engagements? How does the study of the historical moment of the late 1800 nationalism foreground the next major linguistic shift in the American colonial project of the Philippines? What remains of the phantom of Castilian translation in the next colonial setup? I would have wanted to know where nationalism lies thereafter, how, how, it, has, uh, how it was has engaged in the newer colonial setup in a divergent and parallel take of Spanish colonialism. Eighth, is it only the foreign that substantiates the translation process? How might the indigene colonized native vernacular engage the translation for nationalism? What are the primary operations for the vernacular, or in the Philippine case, for the vernacular to, to, to substantiate nationalism via primary, via primary engagement in its locus rather than through the foreign? Or is nationalism already a foreign translation? As with others, as with what others have asked of Benedict Anderson's project of nationalism outside the West, only through the frame of Western nationalism, what are we then left with, with to imagine ourselves if we cannot imagine ourselves and our nationalism outside the purview of the foreign? While theorizing a pragmatic use of the foreign, how then does one activate the foreign, the processes of indigenization, democratization, agency and collectivity, adaptation, rewriting, rereading of the foreign? What, if at all, is the political efficacy of the vernaculars or one's capacity to translate across languages? Lastly, where in translation does the untranslatable lie? And what does it mean that the supplement or the trace untranslatable remains as such? What is the untranslatable in the national dis dis discourse of the period? What in, what in the untranslatable gives the weakness to the promise of the foreign where to paraphrase a Lacan's formulation, the letter does not always arrive at, to its destination, meaning the promise is not always fulfilled. In this uh, unfulfilled instances, how can it be read in favor of a productive nationalism that can be revitalized for the present counter-official nationalist time? I realize, of course, that the battery of question may seem unfair to Raphael, but then I too am translating his foreign in order to realize my own relationship with this discourse. Thank you. Thank you so much for those comments. They were all interesting in their own ways. Uh, Professor, before the response, 